Turn this thing on. Very, very professional this morning. I'm loud, but I'm probably not that loud. Um, so good morning. It's great, great to be here. Uh, I just want to say, um, if you are, if you're new today, um, if this is your first day, I would tell you this. Uh, we're super glad you're here today, but come back next week because I'd really love for you to meet our pastor. Um, our pastor is such a great guy. He is, he's, yeah, let, let's hear it. He's not, and I'm not just doing this because he might be watching. I, I really, I, I'm, I'm serious. He's a great guy. The, the, the pastor Mike that you see up here is the pastor Mike that you encounter during the week. He's just such a consistent man of God. And, and I'll tell you what, he is a great boss. He's a great pastor. He's also a great mentor and a great friend. And so uh, I just want to encourage you, if you're new today, if you enjoy today, you're going to love next week meeting Pastor Mike. But I am excited. I always love an opportunity to be up here and share God's word with, with y'all. And um, so, uh, so let me tell you, uh, years ago, I was on a mission trip. Um, I was on a mission trip to a little country called Moldova. And I was with this guy who was, was me and this other guy. We were on a mission trip working with some church planners, planning for some teams that were coming that summer. And uh, so we had been there that week, and, and we were on the way home. It was time to go home from Moldova. And uh, we went to the, the airport in Chisinau, and, and we had to get up real early and get a ride to the airport. So, you know, we went in to the airport, and, uh, and uh, I hadn't had any coffee yet. And I'm one of those guys that like, oh man, I really, I usually, this is me in the morning when I come out of the room, I'm looking for the coffee, you know, I'm just, uh, I find, once I drink some coffee, then I start talking. No one in my house even talks to me until I've taken a sip of coffee. And so I, I was, you know, I was a little rough that morning, like, oh man, I got, I've all the, we've gotten all the way to the airport. And so we get in the airport, we get all through everything, get to our gate, and there's this like, thing that in that airport they have one stop shop for everything so I'm up getting coffee and everybody else is doing whatever else they're doing and there's this young American guy there sitting at the the little bar thing where you get the coffee and he has a big bottle of something and he has all these glasses and he's hooting and hollering and you know when you go to Europe that everybody can tell Americans because they're woohoo yeah you know and, uh, and so anyway I can tell he's an American and I walk up and he can tell I'm an American not that I don't look like an American guy I don't know but anyway he can tell, and so he goes, hey, man, I've been in Moldova six months. He'd been doing some humanitarian aid thing or something, and I'm going home, and I'm celebrating, and he pours something out of this bottle in this glass and slides it in front of me. Come on, let's celebrate. And I was like, oh, all right, man, I, I, don't want, I don't like turn down people's hospitality. He seemed like a nice guy, but I'm like, hey, man, um, you know, dude, I don't drink, and uh, so sorry. And he goes, What? He goes, don't worry, man, you're not flying the plane or anything. You can go, you can get a drink. I'm like, no, 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 it's not because I'm driving. I just don't drink. And he looked at me then and he goes, wait, are you a missionary? And when he said it, he almost like spit on the ground when he said it. And I was like, well, yeah, actually, my, my friend and I have been here doing some mission work this week. And, and this guy immediately, just his demeanor changed. He goes, oh, great, a missionary. He said, it's bad enough, these people struggling in life, and then you're going to come in here and try to push your religion on them and all this. He obviously did not like missionaries, or he had some bad experience with missionaries. I don't know what the case was, but immediately I'm like, okay, God, there's some big walls coming up right away, huge walls. This guy, he, he, he just, he was obviously angry, and I tried to say, no, it's not that way, you know, we try, and he didn't agree with anything I said, and, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to get in a shouting match in the middle of the airport at, like, you know, six in the morning with this guy, so I got my coffee and said, hey, man, I, I hope you, you get home safe and everything, and I, and I walked over to my gate, and I prayed, I'm like, I'm like God, I don't know what to do about that guy, because he seems pretty closed off to anything, so I just pray that you know, something happened at some point. Well, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that that bar thing was right next to our gate. And when he, they were started calling our plane, and I realized, oh, wait, he's on. It was a flight from Moldova to Frankfurt, which is Frankfurt's when we were going back to the United States. Oh, I think that guy's on my flight. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be funny? <laughs> wouldn't it be funny? I'm in seat. This is back when you actually had a paper ticket. I'm in seat. 23B, wouldn't it be funny if that guy was in 23A? 
Well, I went off and went to the bathroom, and when I came back out, the flight had already started boarding, and my seats had already boarded, and I didn't see that guy anywhere. And so I go, and I get on the plane, and you know, I'm like looking down the middle aisle, and I'm like, okay, I don't see that guy in the front. And I'm getting back closer to the 20s. I'm like, oh, there's that guy. He's in 20-something. I'm sure it's 24, 25. Nope, nope, 23A. I, and I'm sure this guy's going, oh, here comes that missionary guy. He better not be, there's a seat open next. We better not be here. And sure enough, I walk up. I'm like, hey, man, I'm right there. He looks at me like, I'm li listen, dude, it's on the ticket. You can look at it. You know, I'm not trying to chase you down. I'm not really that way. I'm not like, if when people are, I don't like hunt people down and just corner them and like demand things from them. So <clears throat> I sat down and I immediately, I'm like, God, I remember praying, God, I, I don't know what exactly you want me to do right now. I know there's some big walls, but it seems to me like you're not done with this interaction between me and this guy. And this guy looks at me and he says, I'll tell you what I don't want to talk about. And by the way, I usually don't, I'm a talker, but when I'm a plane, my personality changes. I'm just like, put my head in, just like, I'm like, I feel weird. Like we're forced to sit next to each other. Doesn't mean we have to, you know, get to know everything about each other's lives. But I, and, I, and that's a bad thing. Maybe I need to get better about that. But I just was like, what? He goes, I know, I'll tell you what I don't want to talk about. And I'm like, oh, what's that? He goes, I don't want to talk about God. And I was like, all right, man. He goes, see, the thing is, and the guy goes into this long monologue about his experiences with people who would say they believe in God and what God has done in his life or not done in his life and how he feels about God. Guess what? I think the flight, I can't remember anymore. It's like maybe two hours or two and a half hours from Frankfurt to, or from, sorry, Moldova, Kishina, Moldova to Frankfurt. Someone can look it up. It doesn't matter. Anyway, the only thing we talked about was God the whole time. He talked about his, what he thinks the gospel was. I was like, no, no, I'm bringing up scripture. It doesn't matter really what you think. It matters what God says the gospel is. And we, we talked the whole time. We didn't like yell and scream at each other. He, he got, it got a little tense every once in a while, but, but it was really cordial. And then the crazy thing is about halfway through that conversation, halfway through that flight, I started realizing something. I was like, man, when I started talking to this guy this morning, there were some huge walls up and, and those walls kind of almost stopped me in my tracks but but I realized something God was at work behind those walls and it and it, I think God was working on this guy before I ever had talked to him I it didn't it didn't seem like it had much to do with me at all it had to work that God was working on this guy and I couldn't see it through the walls that he had put up and as I kept moving forward, he, all of a sudden I was seeing that God was working behind those walls. Now, I'm not going to say that that guy bowed down and, and received Jesus that morning on the plane. But I will tell you this, when, when we were getting off the plane, he said, man, I, wanna appreci I, I just want to tell you I appreciate you. I was like, oh, why? He goes, man, I know I was rude to you when we first met, but for some reason... You, you, still, you still talk to me and you were still nice back. And he said, you know, and, and you've given me a lot to think about from what you said. So I just want to thank you for that. Just, just know that, you know, this conversation, I'm going to be thinking a lot about it. And so God was working. And you know what? You know what that, 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 that interaction between that guy, that, the, the, that experience, you know what it taught me? It taught me one thing. It taught me this. That when you move forward in obedience to where God has called you, you're going to encounter walls. But we need to remember that God is at work behind those walls. God is at work behind those walls. Today we're going to look, and we're actually going to get in the Bible, trust me. I just, I watched this thing that says you're supposed to have a good story to get everybody engaged. So I was trying to do that. Anyway, so here's the deal. Then we're going to look at Joshua chapter 2, and we're going to see, and it's a real story. It really happened. I didn't just make it up. We're going to see. That would be terrible. That would be like lying in, on, from the pulpit. But anyway, we're, I, I got to stop saying all this extra stuff. It's not in my notes. <laughs> Today, we are going to look at Joshua 2. We're going to see where God was at the work behind the walls that the Israelites were about to face in Joshua 2. So uh, 
So before we, we're going to focus in, we're going to hone in on a couple verses right in the middle of Joshua 2, but I kind of got to give you some context and background of what's happening. So when the book of Joshua starts out in chapter 1, so Moses has died. <clears throat> you know, the Israelites have been roaming in the, in the wilderness for 40 years, and uh, <clears throat> they're about to move into the promised land, and Moses has died, and Joshua has been chosen now. And Joshua was Moses' assistant, and he is going to lead the people into the promised land. God has, has decided that Joshua is going to do this. And jo God actually speaks to Joshua and says, hey, um, I'm going to use you. You're going you're gonna to be like Moses was, and I, I'm gonna, you're going to lead the, my people into the promised land. I'm going to need you to be strong and courageous. And then he says again, I'm going to need you to be very strong and very courageous. Joshua might have been like, uh-oh, very strong, very courageous. And then... He says, so we're gonna do, you're going to do this, and you're going to keep my word, and, and I'm going to be with you like I was with Moses. And then Joshua goes to the people, and the people say, okay, we're going to follow you like we followed Moses. But they even say, but we need you to be very strong and very courageous. And so he does. He says, okay, that's good. So, so basically where we leave off in chapter, in chap, the start of chapter 2, Joshua says, okay, we're going to move into the promised land. God has told us to move in. And he said that he's going to give us this land. So, you know, get ready, everybody. He gives them some instructions. They're going to go across the Jordan. But so starting at chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, I'm going to get us up through the seven verse, first seven verses just explaining some things. And we're going to really dig in in verse 8 through uh, 13. And it, sa it says this. So just at the beginning of, of chapter 2, Joshua sent two men secretly into the promised land to scope it out, and particularly want them to check out Jericho. Jericho was a city with a, a, a very fortified city with a huge wall around it that, that was going to be key for them to taking the land. And uh, he said, so go, go, go check out the land, and, and especially Jericho. And so the spies go into the land, and I'm guessing they must be, um, they must have been pretty bad spies, because... Uh, the, it was told immediately, and the, the ver, first verse is him sending them in. Next verse is, and it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, the men of Israel have come tonight to search out the land. So they got caught like their first night being spies. So I don't know. I don't know what kind of spies they were. I don't know if they were like interviewing all the guys on the wall saying like, hey, uh, where's the weakest point of the wall or something? Like, I don't know what they were doing. But so they go to, the, to Rahab's house, and they're, they're hidden out in her house, and Rahab is is a, a, just a Canaanite woman. She lives there. She lives in, in part of the wall. Um, she does not live a godly lifestyle. There's nothing about her that, that would stand out. She was just a person. Well, there is going to be eventually here something huge that would stand out. But um, she is, is a, who they went and stayed with. And, and so anyway, she's not like an Israelite or anything. She's a Canaanite woman. And so they go and they stay. And immediately the king sends people to, the, their house, to Rahab's house. Hey, these two spies are at your house. And Rahab just goes, she hides them. She hides them on her roof. And she goes, hey, yeah, um, they were here, but they left. They went out the gate just before it shut at night, and they're gone now. She lies to them and says they, they've taken off. She protects the Israelite spies. And she sends the king's men off on this wild goose chase to go chase spies that, that were actually up on her roof. So that, that's kind of what happens right here. And then in verse 8, I just tried to move my Bible up like my iPad. So anyway, in <laughs> verse 8, <laughs> it doesn't work. you got to flip the page. <laughs> so the, the spies, that just, I just messed everything up. I'm so sorry. So verse 8, verse 8, this is where I want to start reading. This is amazing. This is amazing. You guys are going to love this. It says this, and verse, starting in verse 8. Before the men fell asleep, that's the two spies who were up on the roof, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Seas before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. 
Now please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my family because I showed kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them. Save us from death. It blows me away. See, see, here's the thing we got to remember. You know what this passage tells me? It's what we've been saying. It's number one in your notes. God is at work behind the walls that stand between us and his promises. So I always try to, so, so usually when people read this passage, they give everything through the perspective of, of Rahab. And, and, and usually that's how people preach this passage. They talk about Rahab. I'm kind of doing it a little different through the perspective of the spies and the Israelites. Because the, the passage is about God. It's not about any other character but God. But, but we, we can see God at work through the different perspectives of these different characters in here. And so, so my thing is this. These spies, imagine how shocked they might have been. Wait, wait, wait. You, you guys are afraid of us. What? You guys are in this city with a huge wall around it. It's impenetrable. We're just a bunch of practically nomads wandering around the wilderness on the other side of the Jordan. And you're afraid of us? And, and, and they might have been like, I don't get it. Maybe at first they didn't get it. And, and see, God had promised them this land, though. God had promised them this land. And we have a God who fulfills his promises. And he's at work even when we don't see it. And, 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 you know, there are walls. There are walls that stand between us and God's promises. These guys probably were thinking, how in the world are we going to take this city with these huge walls around it? And then they get in and find out that these people in this city are shuddering in fear. They're shuddering in fear. Rahab, like I said, she was a, a Canaanite woman with an ungodly lifestyle. I won't get into it, but a very ungodly lifestyle. And, and she it were, it were lived in a culture where they worshipped all sorts of false gods. And, and she, God, was showing her the truth about himself. God was revealing the truth about himself to this lady who was not in Israel. The Israelites had not come in there and preach to them or told them about their God. God revealed that to her without them. And... And she was willing to risk her life and turn on her own people for God's purposes. I mean, that's just unexpected, I think. And, and she had walls to overcome in her own life as well. I mean, she's about to turn her on her people. She's trusting that this is all going to happen. She's believing in God. And here's the thing. Terror and panic hadn't only fallen over Jericho. If you look in verse 9, she says at the end of verse 9, and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. So the Israelites think of their perspective on the other side of the Jordan River. Out of the other side of the Jordan River, they're thinking, how are we going to do this? Look at this amazing place. And little do they know on the other side of the Jordan, in this promised land, in these fortified cities, people are scared to death. But I want to make something clear. Why were the people panicking? Why were the people in Jericho afraid and panicking? It wasn't because of the Israelites. It wasn't, it wasn't because, oh man, those Israelites, they got these like wall buster tomahawk cattle pults or something like that. No, it's nothing like that. Here, let, let me just read again 9 through 11. <clears throat> this is what Rahab said to them. And said to them, I know that the Lord, the Lord, capital L, has given you this land. And that the terror of you has fallen on us. And everyone who lives in the land is mechanicking because of you. But here's what they heard. For we heard how the Lord dried up the, land, the waters of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og and the two Amorite kings, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. Listen to verse 11. We heard this and we lost heart. Everyone's courage failed because of you. So it almost sounds like the Israelites. But then listen to this. For the Lord your God is God in heaven and on and above heaven above and on the earth below. The Lord your God, this is a Canaanite woman, by the way, who's been raised completely different than this, and she recognizes that the Lord your God 
is the God in heaven above and on the earth below. The people were panicked not because of Israel. They were panicked because of Israel's God. God had been at work behind those walls and in the promised land. God had work, been at work and working in ways that, that they couldn't see. And I tell you this, I believe this in my whole heart. God is working today in ways that we cannot see. He's working today in ways we cannot see behind the walls in our life. I want to tell you just a kind of a, I'm on a missionary kind of kick today. There was another mission trip I went on um, a, lo a long time ago <clears throat> with the same guy, matter of fact. We went on a lot of mission trips together. And we took a small team and we went to the country of Bangladesh in South Asia. Um, and Bangladesh is a Muslim country. And a lot of people don't like to go on mission trips to Muslim countries. There's a lot of walls, by the way. There are a lot of walls keeping us as Christian Americans from reaching out to Muslims in the Muslim world. There's walls of, of fear and misunderstanding. We don't understand them. They don't understand us. There's walls that it's far away. There's walls that it's expensive to go there. It takes more time to get there and be there. It's harder to go. Here, the other wall is sometimes they don't want you there. And they definitely don't want you talking about Jesus there. Uh, trust me, I have other experiences in other Muslim countries. I can tell, share all about it. But here's the deal. God loves them. And he wants them to hear the gospel. And he's called us to be a part of getting the gospel to every tribe and tongue. Even if they don't want to hear it, we, he's called us to get there and get them a chance to hear it. And so we were on one of these trips and, and we were going door to door in these villages. The way we were doing it is we were wanting to have a conversation uh, about Jesus with them. But what we did is we went to the leader of each village and, and to respect them and said, hey, can we have a conversation? We're followers of Jesus from America and we want to talk to you and, and learn what you guys believe about Jesus and share with you what we believe. We want to talk to you first because we respect that you're the leader of this village. Well, <clears throat> We would go, and it was one, myself, and I was with a younger person, and my buddy George, he was with a younger person. We had some, like, older teenagers with us. Their, their parents said, okay, go ahead, go to South Asia, have fun in the country. Their parents were parents of faith, you know? And um, so we went, and George came up to a door. And you remember, he knocked on the door. I was always a little nervous when we knocked on the door. And George came up to the door, and he said to the guy, hey, and Isa is the Arabic word for Jesus. He said, hey, we're here. We want to talk to you about Isa and find out what you guys believe in talk. And the guy looked at him, and he said, you need to come in. You need to come in quickly. Come in. He was very excited. And, and you know, you're always a little bit leery. Okay, why is this guy so excited about getting me in the house? But anyway, <laughs> George said, oh, yeah, well, sure, we'll come in. Is everything okay? He goes, Oh, yes, he goes, I had a dream. I had a dream. And Isa, Jesus, appeared to me in my dream. And he said, yeah, this really happened. It's happening all over the Muslim world. He said that he was going to send one of his followers to come and tell me about him. And that I should let him in and listen. Whew. Just telling that story still. George says the hairs on the back of his head, or back of his neck, whatever they are, stood up. The poor teenager with him. It's like, what is happening? You know, he's like, and so they, they went in the house and this guy prayed to receive Christ and he's, he's reaching out in his village right now and he's, he's, this is one of the leaders and this is a key moment, George. That, that's amazing. But you know what? There were so many walls between George and that guy. So many walls, more than just the door that was blocking him. So many walls, cultural walls and all these different walls and God was at work behind that wall. God was at work. You know what Jesus has said to us? In Luke, uh, Luke 10, verse 2 is one of the examples. It says this. It says, he told them, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. You know, another version I love, it says, the fields are ripened unto harvest. You know what that verse says? That, that verse says, like, hey, the harvest there are people out there, God, that's saying that I have been working on. And they just need you to show up and step through these walls and, and just share about me. And they're going to be ready. Now, some, I know you guys are like, I've shared the gospel with people who aren't ready. Yes, but there are people out there that are. The, Jesus says this, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Jesus tells us here that we, he needs workers to go out into his harvest that he has been working on in ways we cannot see. You know what? You know what that tells me? God is at work. God is at work in the hearts of your neighbors, of your co-workers, of your classmates, of your families. He's at work in ways that we can't see. 
And I know there's walls. I know there's walls that, that are stopping us so often from joining God and his purpose for our life and believing his promises. I know that the walls are real. But let me tell you, there's walls. There's walls of past failures. I can't talk to them. I failed them so many times. In the past. I failed in the past and they know. There's walls of broken relationships. Oh, I've screwed up that relationship. That'll never work. There's walls of shame. I'm so ashamed of, of what happened, what I've done in my life. There's feelings of inadequacy. There's walls of inadequacy. I can't do that. I just me. I, I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. There's walls of uncertainty. What will happen if I try to move forward through this wall? What will happen? There's walls of anger. Maybe you're angry and you got to deal with that. There's walls of pride. There's walls of depression. There's walls of complacency. There's walls of addiction. There's walls of loss. There's walls of sickness. There's walls of fear, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of change, fear of inconvenience. See, I'm not here today to downplay the walls. We've all got real walls in our life. We've got walls. If I was up here saying, hey, you know, walls, just you walk. No, you all be like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. No, there's real walls. But here's the thing, God is at work behind those walls. He's at work. You know, quite often as a pastor, I talk to people facing big walls in their life, and they'll always ask me, Glenn, what is God doing here? In a hospital, when someone's just got a diagnosis that they did not want to hear, that does not say, what is God doing here? Quite often I have to say, I don't know, but I know that he's doing something. I know that he's at work. And we're going to pray together and we're going to figure out. And I'm going to walk alongside him. And we're going to figure out what it is he's, he's doing. Because we can trust him. He's at work even in ways we can't see. So, so how do we do this? How do we keep these walls from stopping us as we pursue God's purpose and his promises in our lives? How do we stop? How do we keep us from being stopped in our tracks? First thing, and it's number two on your notes. Stop measuring our strength up against the strength of the walls. Stop measuring our own strength up against the strength of the walls. we got to stop that. See, let me tell you, this isn't the first time that Israelites sent spies into the promised land. Uh, Forty years before, they sent 12 spies into the promised land. I, I just want to show you, uh, it's in Numbers. Numbers 13, I'm going to read you something real quick. And uh, just tell you how that went. All right? So Numbers uh, 13, verses 27 through, through 32. This is when the spies came back to give a report of what they found in the promised land 40 years before. It says, they reported to Moses, when we went into the land where you sent us, indeed it is flowing with milk and honey, and here is some of its fruit. However, the people living in the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, We must go up and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. But the men who had gone up with him responded, We can't go up against the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they had scouted. The land we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. All the people we saw in it are men of great size. <sighs> they, God, the God of the universe said, the God who created the land, created the people said, I'm giving you this land, go get it. Oh no, they're too big. We can't do anything about, it. we can't take them. They, they forgot the fact that God said, I'm going to give you this land. He didn't say, you have to get it yourself. He promised them the land. And, and so here's the thing. They saw the, they saw the fortified cities. They saw the walls. And they stopped dead in their tracks. They said, no, no, we're just going to stay here. Well, then listen to what happens. It gets worse. Numbers 14, 1 through 4. So the whole community broke into loud cries, and the people wept all night, and all the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron, and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and little children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? 
So they said, let's up. Let's, I said to one another, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. And, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful for the Israelites. It did say they broke out into loud cries and the people wept all night. And that's what I think it sounded like. So anyway, sometimes though, you know, sometimes when I read the Old Testament, I read the, the, the people of Israel about their, their journeys and their travels. I, I said, these are God's chosen people that he loves. And, but sometimes I'm not going to lie. When I was little in church, I would say, where did God find these people? They're always complaining. They're always, they just want to go back to Egypt. They want to, they're, they're just, what's, what's their problem? But then, you know, as I've gotten older in my life, unfortunately, I found myself being re- able to relate much more than I should to the people of Israel. I've hit walls in my life and they've stopped me dead in my tracks. And I've measured my strength up against the strength of the walls. And, and I've, I've just said, I can't do it. How am I supposed to do this, God? See, just like the Israelites, I've ignored the freedom that God has given me to pursue his purposes and his promises, and I've chose to live like I'm back in slavery, that I, the slavery that I experienced before I knew Christ, purposeless and subject to the circumstances around me. Sometimes I get stuck measuring my strength up against the strength of the walls, and I just want to go back and live like God had, doesn't have a purpose for me and he doesn't have promises for me. It's happened to me in my life more than once. But boy, I, I'm so glad that God is teaching me that not to do that. I'm not going to read it all because of time, but Numbers uh, 14, 26 through 35. So, so God tells Moses, that's fine. Go tell the people. They don't have to go in the promised land. They're going to wander the wilderness for 40 years until this whole generation dies off. Except for Joshua and Caleb, they're going to wander the wilderness and they're going to die off. And I'm going to give the next generation a shot at at the promises that I have. You know what I don't want to do in my life? I don't want to waste my life spiritually wandering in the wilderness and missing out on God's best plan and purpose for my life. Because I'm afraid to move forward into what he promises me because I am measuring my strength. I don't want to do that. And I don't think our church wants to do that either. See, the Israelites, that's what they ended up doing. They ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years of their lives, the last 40 years of their lives, missing out on God's best for them because they measured their strength up against the strength of the wall. So what do we do? Glenn, this is getting depressing. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you what, number three in your notes, here's what we need to do. We need to believe God and trust him to handle the wall. We need to believe God and trust him to handle the walls in our life. So I love what happened when, uh, okay, verses 14 through 22. I'm just going to talk you through and we're going to read 23 and 24. 14 through 24, the spies, the spies agree actually. They say to Rahab, okay, thank you. You saved us. We're going to spare you and your family. We're making a deal right now. <clears throat> um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hang a scarlet cord by your window. There's a whole sermon we could do on that, but we, I, I will get in trouble. And, and you guys will miss Connect Group. So anyway, um, but it's really cool. They hang a scarlet cord so we know it's you. Tell your family, stay in their house, and we're going to spare you. And then she tells them, here's how you can get away. Here's how you can go back to your camp. And so they leave. And then uh, in verses 23 and 24, listen to this of Joshua 2. Then the men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed the Jordan. They went to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported everything that had happened to them. And listen to what they told Joshua. It says, they told Joshua, the Lord has handed over the entire land to us. Everyone who lives in the land is also panicking because of us. By the way, nothing changed about the walls. They're still there. They didn't say, hey, we found out that there's a tunnel that goes under the walls. We can sneak into the city at night. They have no idea how it's going to happen. And I bet you if they found out, because it's pretty crazy, spoiler alert, but the walls fall down. God just knocks them down. Anyway, but if they knew how it was going to happen, they would have flipped out in that moment. They didn't know how it was going to happen. They just knew God had promised them, and he's at work behind those walls, and they were going to move forward. They said, Joshua, let's go forward. See, you know what they did? And this is so important to get in our life today. They focused on the God who made the promises, not the wall standing in the way. 
tell you what, you're going to hit walls in your life. You're going to hit walls every day, probably of your life, some kind of wall. You're going to hit huge walls and small walls. And we've got to start focusing on the God who has made the promises to us and the God who set our purpose ahead of us and stop focusing on the wall. If there's anything I can tell people when they're facing stuff, if there's anything I could beg for them to do, that would, I would say focus on the God that made the promise, the God who's given you the purpose. Don't focus on the wall. So I want to look in the New Testament in our last couple minutes here. I want to show you something that, that really applies to us today as a church, I believe. So, so uh, God has given us some purposes and some promises as a church today. One big purpose he's given is found in Matthew 28. Imagine that, 18 through 20. Not just 19, but 18, because I want to talk about that real quick. It says this, And Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on the earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Yes, he's given us that purpose and there's some promises in there too. So he starts out in verse 18. He says this, Jesus came near and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Remember in verse 11, Rahab said this, the Lord your God is God in heaven above and earth below. Guess what? That same God is talking right here to us. Jesus is saying, and I'm, I'm, I have authority in heaven and on earth. I have the same authority. And so he says this, he says, go and make disciples. He tells us to go and make disciples. By the way, he doesn't say that it's going to be easy. He doesn't say there's not going to be walls in the way. He doesn't say that there's not going to be heartache. He doesn't say that it's not going to be difficult. He just says, go. Here's your purpose. Here's your purpose. And, and make disciples. And, and he reminds us who he is in verse 18. By the way, the one I'm the one telling you this, and I have all the authority over heaven and the earth. I can work in ways you can't see. And then he tells us to go and, and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to obey him. And then he says something great, a great promise at the very end of verse 20. He says, and remember, I am with you always. Even to the engine. We're not going into doing this alone. The God of the universe is right there when a wall goes in front of you. You can go, hey, I can't handle that wall. Um, you got it, right? Because I'm going to move forward, so I'm expecting something to happen. And, and here's the thing. He promises he's going to go with us. Acts 1.8 says it this way. I didn't put that in your notes. But Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. <laughs> you, you don't have to be afraid of walls. You, yeah, you've got to think and figure out and ask God how well, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to trust you and we're going to try to get through this and I don't know what's going to happen. But, but we've got to move forward as a church and we, we can't let these walls stop us and we can't be wandering around in the wilderness. I think too often in the church there's so many that are spiritually wandering in the wilderness. They're missing out. They're saying, I don't get this Christian life. I don't get everybody's telling me there's supposed to be joy and peace and hope. There's supposed to be all this purpose. And, but but and nine times out of ten I can identify some place where a wall stopped them and they're just like, I can't go anywhere forward. I can't move forward. So don't do that. So here's, here's, what, here's what this means to us today. What does this mean to us today? I believe that every single one of us can sit down in our mind, we can close our eyes, and we can think of a wall that we're facing in our life today. If you can't think of one now, trust me, you're going to face walls in your life. And I think what we need to do today is we need to remember that God is at work behind those walls. We need to remember that we don't have to measure our strength up against the strength of those walls. And what we need to do when we encounter them, we need to trust God and move forward. And, and we need <clears throat> to believe God. And we need to trust him to handle that wall. So some of you today, there's some walls. Maybe they're keeping you from fulfilling the purpose God has for you in your life. And they're real. That's the thing. I'm not saying they're not real and I'm not saying they're not there. 
I have compassion about these walls, but I trust me, God is at work. And we got to focus on him, focus on the God who made the promises and gave us the purpose and not the wall. We need to look to him and say, God, how do you want me to move forward? Because I'm going to move forward. You know, Joshua, they didn't, they didn't find out about God at work until Joshua made the decision. All right, we're moving out. And then I'm sending these spies in just to figure out where we're, how we're heading in there. That's, Joshua took that step of faith and God showed him where he was working. So there might be someone in here today, though, some of you, you might be like, Glenn, you're talking about God like he's your buddy or like you know him and you're experiencing him and stuff like that. That's, that's not my relationship with God. See, every single one of us is born with a huge wall between us and God, a massive, impenetrable wall. You can't get over it. You can't get around it. You can't get through it. That wall is called sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So it says this in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of that sin, what we earn through that sin is death. Not just a physical death, but spiritual death. It's separated. There's a wall that separates every single one of us from birth, from God. But it says this. It says this. In the, that verse says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, if we measure our own strength, our own goodness up against the goodness of God, there's a wall we can't. We can't get through it with our, on our own. The only one who can get through that wall is God himself. And he busted through that wall by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, pay the price that we couldn't pay, live the life that we couldn't live. And if we believe in him, we don't have to depend on our strength to get through the wall. He got through it for us. And we are able to know God. Here's how it works. It works this, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trust God. Believe he is who he says he is and move forward and say, I'm going to go in you. You earned this way through this wall, not me. I couldn't do it on my own, but I'm going to trust you now. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to believe what the purpose and promises you have for my life are true and I'm going to go after them. And that's all you do. You believe that Jesus did it for you and you follow him. And you move forward in faith. The Bible says this is how much God loves you, by the way. In Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God isn't so much worried about your past. He's worried about your future. He, he wants to forgive your past. And he wants to give you a, a future of knowing him here on earth. And yeah, there's going to be walls and there's going to be hard times, but you're going to spend eternity with him. The Bible says this, too. You might be like, Glenn, but you don't know me. Well, God knows you. God says this in Romans 10, 13, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Remember, you don't get through the wall in your own strength. It's God's strength. So I'm telling you today, if you're in here today, every single person, if you're a believer today, I want you to think about those walls. I want you to identify some of those walls in your life and I, and I want you to, to think through, to, to ask God to help you. Ask God to give you the faith and give you the courage to walk towards those walls and trust him to get through them. I'm going to ask you to focus on the God who's, who's made the promises and the purpose for your life and not focus on the walls. If you are here today and you're like, Glenn, this is all new to me. I would love nothing more to get to talk to you after. I would ask you to trust Jesus today. Trust Jesus today to get through that wall of sin and begin a relationship with him. Because he says in here, for those of us that believe in him, believe in him and follow him, he's going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. You're going to have the God of the universe with you. You're not going to face another wall in your life alone. So I'm going to pray. And then uh, after that, we're actually going to close. And, um, and, but if you want to talk to me today, you, maybe you want prayer about the wall you're facing. Or maybe you're like, I, Glenn, I need to begin that relationship with Jesus right now. I'm gonna be here, some other people, we're gonna be standing up front and we'd love to talk to you. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you that you are a God that is in control. There is no wall that you cannot break down. No wall in my life or anyone's life in here that you cannot break down. Lord God, I thank you for that. And I just pray today 
that as we leave this church today that we will focus on you, the God who has given us a purpose in life and given us some promises in life. And we won't focus so much on the walls and we won't measure our strength up against the walls. We'll measure your strength up against the walls in our life and we're going to move through them and we are going to believe with all our heart that you are at work on the other side of those walls. God, I pray, I know that's going to that's gonna live out in different ways in all of our lives, but I pray that we would trust you this week and you would, we would come back next week with stories of how you have smashed walls down in lives. Maybe people that have been wandering for a while, Lord, and they've decided I'm done wandering. I'm going to go and I'm going to face this wall with my Savior right there with me. And he's going to break it down for me. Lord, I just pray for that. I pray for anyone in here today that doesn't know you, that they, even if they have questions about knowing you today, that they wouldn't leave here today without talking to someone, me or even someone they came with, and find out what it, what it means to know you. And, and God, that they would, they would recognize that there's a God that loves them. There's a God that wants them to experience him and know him no matter what they've done. There's a God who wants them to experience what they've been created to experience, a relationship with the living God. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for our pastor as he's uh, away right now, that he would come back safe. And Lord, I pray that you would help us this week as we go out, that I pray that people this week would come to know you through the ministry of people in this church. It's in your name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much. You're dismissed.